at a time when we are all practicing social distancing. And thank you for, uh, and thank you very much to Professor Spriti Harijaran for this wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, so uh, this is, this is, uh, this is, um, I really feel privileged to be part of this uh, lecture series here. Now, hopefully you can see the screen here. And today, just, just before I start, I'll just give you a word of warning that sometime for the monsoon, this heavy monsoon here, sometimes there are power cuts and stuff. So in case you see a blackout on screen, please do not panic. I'd be back in five minutes or so. So uh, today, uh, the topic of our discussion, my discussion will be sensorial histories of Kalamkari and reconstruction of artisanal knowledge in Southern India. So first I will start talking about some of the terms that I used in my title. And hopefully that will lead us to certain questions in the field, certain problems in the field. And from there I'll go on to two case studies. So that is how I'm planning my entire presentation. Now let's start with the idea of history. So when I'm talking about histories and as opposed to a dominant version of history, then I am acknowledging the plurality of historical narratives and the plurality of historical narratives, acknowledging them has been a really important part of, um, you know, my, my, my research is because uh, this is the uh, way we can challenge the dominant historical narratives and there can be more ways to bring out the marginalized vo voices which have been suppressed for years, for centuries uh, in this case. So when we are talking about the plurality of historical narratives, we also need to think that how this idea of the dominant and the marginalized also plays out with uh, uh, when we are engaging with the historical investigation. So for example, how our senses play out a role in this investigation. And if we see that clearly, then we see uh, even though all of our senses are some way or other involved in historical investigation, but our eyes always play an important part in it. Our eyes, uh, we, we see with our eyes, we analyze things, we uh, read, we write, and we do our visual analysis, everything with our eyes. So for that reason, there is always a predominance of um, our, the faculty of seeing in our historical investigation in order to bring out more marginalized voices in the historical narratives and in investigations, we need to incorporate, we need to actively incorporate the other sensory faculty. So for example, what is history through hearing? So and that, that uh, question had been very masterfully handled by the, um, by the, in, in the oral history discipline. And then thinking about what is history through touches? So that question also has been handled by um, the, the scholars and the practitioners in craft studies and in archeology span and anthropology. So this is, this is some of the ways, and also we can think about what is history through smell, what is history through taste, and some of those aspects will come up in our discussion this evening. So uh, if to sum up these issues, so by sensorial histories in my title, I mean that uh, the acknowledgement of plurality of narratives perceived through different sensory engagement with historical material or an issue. That is what I understand as sensorial histories. Now the question comes, why we need sensorial histories for Kalamkari? I'm trying to, oops, sorry, technical issue. So um, why we need sensorial histories of Kalamkari? So let me just get into some of the basics of Kalamkari that then we'll go into why we need sensorial histories of Kalamkari. So Kalamkari has been this celebrated dyed, painted, printed, and resist dyed textiles from the Coromandel region and Deccan region of Southern India. So I'm thankful to Professor Radhika Session for this wonderful uh, introduction about the, uh, the Coromandel Coast, the textile making, and the early modern trade, which gives us a ground for understanding why the Kalamkari textiles have been important. Now, in the left of the screen, we have one of those Kalamkari textile, textiles, which is a coverlet or a rumal that comes from the collection of National Museum in New Delhi from uh, the mid-17th century. 
And here we see both this, uh, the, the dyeing, painting, and resist dyeing. Three of these uh, techniques are employed in one textile. So Kalamkari has always been this mobile textiles which have moved between various workshops. So that is not all, but also what we see that for, for, the, for the trade relations on the Coromandel coast, as early as from 17th, 16th century, there have been traders from Southeast Asia, from Middle East, from the Mediterranean, from Western Europe, all of them gathered uh, on the Coromandel region. And for that reason, uh, the traders, travelers, uh, and the royals, they have all uh, showed interest in, in this Kalampari textiles. And through this people, Kalampari also found a global audience. So since 17th century, we know that textiles were traveling, at least in the 17th century, we know these Kalampari textiles were traveling to Southeast Asia, parts of Eastern Asia, then Middle East, and uh, of course to Western Europe. And this, this travels, this textile travels, they sort of added up to um, a number of uh, major global collections. So before I just move from there, I'll just, uh, want all of us to just look into the map in the right of the screen. And even though Professor Session has given this wonderful uh, introduction about the, about the area, and I do not want to uh, add to that, just, just one little bit of extra information that the major centers of Kalampari production, what we see in this coastal region, they all somewhere or other, I mean, the major production centers have been concentrated near the confluence of the major rivers and the Bay of Bengal. So at the Delta of Godavari, we have Kalakolu. And then at the Delta of Krishna, we close to the Delta of Krishna, we have Masukatnam and Nizampatnam or Ketaboli. And then uh, at Kaveri, we have Nagapatnam. So when with this early modern trade and later on during the colonial period, when the, the museum collections were setting up, we see a number of major museums in the world. They have showed interest in collecting Kalampari. And from 1950s, we have dedicated studies on Kalampari. And from 1970s, we had uh, a number of blockbuster international exhibitions on Kalampari. So in 1970, we had this pioneering exhibition called The Origin of Chimps at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. And then uh, and here in the left of the screen, we have an image from that, which gives us a sense of the scale of these Kalampari hangings. And not all those textiles were made as hangings. They were bedspreads, mostly utilitarian textiles. So, uh, and then in the right of the screen, we have an image from a more recent exhibition. So from 2000s, in, in, the, in the early 2000s, we find that, I mean, there is a sudden interest in uh, having more dedicated shows on Kalampari or featuring Kalampari as part of their exhibitions. So at, in 2008, we have this exhibition called uh, Chins Indian Textiles for the West. And then we had um, Interwoven Globe at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, which set Kalampari in conversation with other textiles around the world. And then we have Ages of Sarasa at the um, uh, at the, at the Fukuoka Museum of Art in Japan, and then uh, Asia and Amsterdam in 2015 at the Rijksmuseum. So th there had been a series of exhibitions in the recent years. And I'd say that, I mean, it started with the origins of Chins in 1970, which sort of uh, situate Kalamkari in the, in the, in the global, um, in, in the con connection with the global trade and cultural exchanges. And in most of the studies that we see, there is a predominance of um, iconographic analysis. And rightly so, because uh, we do not have much access to touching the museum objects. So we have to see them, we have to see them from a distance, from a safe distance. And then we also need to analyze them through the visuals and to some extent the dye analysis and uh, of course, I mean, uh, the dating of the textiles and so on. So, if these are the ways we can engage with the with the with the textiles, 
then we see that there are more interest in understanding the visuals, the engagement of the traders, then and the role of the inter uh, inter regional trade, then the artisanal contribution the artisans who made these brilliant textiles. So what are the ways we can claim their voices? What are the ways we can bring the artisans actively into this uh, scene? So I'm not denying that there ha hasn't been any study which, uh, which, which uh, talks about the artisans or the technicalities, but it had always been overshadowed by the iconographic analysis. So for that, what we need to do is to bring these historic textiles back to the workshop spaces, connect them to the makers, uh, the, the maker communities. And that's the way we can reconnect these Kalampari textiles, the historical Kalampari textiles, uh, with the, not only with the makers and the regions, but we can also situate them in the realm of human experiences, which is really important. And it not just only um, it not just only benefit the maker of the communities. It not just empower their position, but it also uh, broadens our worldview about these textiles. Our uh, work broadens our worldview about the uh, material culture um, in the Deccan and the Coromandel region in southern India. So to go a little further here we have on screen uh, images of uh, printing so as i have said that there are different um, different artisans they come together for making kalampari so printing on kalampari and printing is always relying on block making which we see in the right of the screen so there are different artisans with their different skill set they come together for uh, contributing to the making of kalampari and in the center of the screen, we have uh, an image of painting directly, directly drawing with column on column by, um, on, on a fabric. So just to go back to that, that I mean, why column has been such an important uh, aspect of the Coromandel and Deccani material culture is to understand that the, how these visuals talk about these interregional and intercultural exchanges. Now this textile, this is a kanak or a tent hanging that comes from again the National Museum collection in New Delhi because we always hear that probably India do not have much of the historical kalampares in our collection, but that's uh, not entirely true. We have some in, in New Delhi, in Calco Museum, as well as in Salajang Museum. So this one in this huge gigantic tent hanging, which is dyed and painted and a little bit of discharge technique is also used in this. So in this tent hanging, we see there are five vertical panels. And in the central panel, we have this dynamic double headed bird, which is flying downward. Now this, uh, well, I mean, in this image, it is hard to see. I'm still pointing my cursor here to you know, have your attention in these areas that in the beak of this bird, this double headed bird, there were two elephants. So this bird, this double headed bird is holding two elephants in its beak and it's flying. Now the closest connection to this bird comes from the image of Gandhavarunda, which is uh, considered as an incarnation of Lord Vishnu in the Kannada and Telugu speaking regions in southern India. However, the Gandhavarunda is never represented uh, you know, heads down. So there is something else going on in this image. We can see that. And there comes some more references. So the dynamism of this bird, the linearity, this, this, uh, and the uh, treatment of the wings, the feathers, and overall uh, appearance, that owes a lot to the Chinese depiction of Phoenix. So we can see that, I mean, there is a depiction of the Phoenix in the left of the screen, and we can see there have been certain exchanges going on between the, you know, between these depictions. Now, not only just Chinese, but I mean, we also see there are Dutch heraldic symbols, which utilize the image of double headed bird. Now I'm trying to indicate the cursor here in the right of the screen, hopefully you can see it. This, is, this comes from a gravestone, a Dutch gravestone from the second half of 17th century uh, from Valandapalem in Mashripatnam. And this, this also shows this double-headed bird. Now the ideas are that 
how we can see that there are different sources, different cultural sources, those are probably uh, coming to this making of the Kalampari textiles and different, uh, we, we can trace certain sources back to different cultures. But at the same time, we also need to understand that the artisans were just not mere receivers of this cultural information from the traders or someone elite. They are absorbing this, uh, the spirit of this uh, intercultural exchange and actively participating in them. They're adding to the visual vocabulary of them because we can, we can see certain features of this double-headed bird in different cultural contexts, but assembling them together or bringing the life force in this bird, that is definitely in the hands of the textile makers. And that part we need to uh, acknowledge and recognize. So uh, if that remains one of the issues, and that is, uh, and this is how we can uh, see how the artisanal point of view or understanding the artisans uh, perspectives can help us understanding the uh, study of the historical material culture, and in this case, the Kalamkari textiles, then what are the ways I plan to employ them in my work? So I, what I try to do here in my research is to bring different knowledge sources. So for example, first of all, the archival studies, the studies which have been done by the traders, the travelers, and later on the scholars in the field, and then definitely studying the textiles themselves from various museum collections, and which has always been eye-opening. But most importantly, uh, having the artisanal perspectives, borrowing insights from the artisans themselves to, to know that, I mean, what they think about making these textiles, to know that what are their, uh, what are their uh, inputs on, 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 on these studies. To, to assemble them together. Now, one of the issues that came up here is that if I'm trying to connect the ongoing Kalamkari making activity, what is happening in the Mashipatnam region or in Hyderabad or in Shikalahasti, and then if I'm mapping these practices onto the historical textiles, for example, this one which is on screen, then I do not see these connections to be seamless or linear. I do not really see that, I mean, there had been a long connecting thread which is connecting them together because there have been a lot of transformation in terms of the coastal ecology. At the same time, the market system has changed a lot and it has been, you know, continuously evolving. So we cannot expect that. But one thing that can come as a connecting thread between them, and that is itself this embodied practice, this ephemeral practice of the artisans. So, we see in a number of disciplines, starting with archaeology, experimental archaeology, anthropology, and craft studies, we have different uh, perspectives on the idea of practice and how there can be a connection or a conversation set up between the uh, historical uh, material culture and the ongoing practices. And one of them, I mean, just I'll, I'll just mention one of them. So here and that, that comes from Pierre Bordeaux. And when he talks about the logic of practice and especially gives definition uh, of, the, uh, of the idea of habitus and among many definitions of habitus, one of the definitions says that when a habitual practice or which I understand as a historically informed practice is carried out in the present moment, this action does not only belong to the present moment, but it also belongs to the past conditions which made this action possible. So this way, a uh, relationship between the past and the present is set up by the means of this practice. And this is something that um, um, I, I certainly consider as a um, fruitful way to uh, continue this discussion further. Now, um, then the, if this is the methodology I'm employing, then what are the kind of uh, learning experiences I had? So I'll go into two learning experience here. And the first one will be to understand, the first one will be to understand that what is, um, what is uh, the, the term Kalamkari means. So because I mean, for a long time, I had my reservation about using the term Kalamkari uh, as I always thought that Kalamkari means 
uh, column uh, handwork with the pen in, in which column or column means pen and pari means handwork. However, uh, if this, uh, and this is the reason I always had my reservation for calling this extremely sophisticated and complicated textiles, which comes to life by a mean of different techniques together, like dyeing, painting, printing, block making, resist dyeing. How do we justify this one term? I mean, how do we justify this entire practice? And, you know, with, with this one term, which basically means that handwork with the pen. So we can, we can think about drawing on textiles and that can, that, that can be justified, but not, not the other practices. However, this one morning in the workshop of um, Master of Block Carpers, Kondra Gangadhar and Kondra Narsaya in Petana near Masti Patnam, we were talking about these terms which are used for their block carving tools. And he mentioned that they all those tools, column, and the tools which you can see, one of those tools you can see um, at, the, at the center of the screen, and where we have uh, this, uh, this, uh, you know, this very small portable iron tool uh, with a pointed tip, and that is used for uh, carving these wooden blocks. And this is also held like a pen, but always with the non-dominant hand. And the dominant hand will be used for using a hammer or a wooden beater to beat it on the top of it, so that I mean you can carve the uh, linear forms on the block surface. Now, first, I thought that it can also be an individualized practice that to call this tool a column. But later on, during other interviews with the block makers here in Helen, so that way we can find that uh, the column is not just a pen which is used for drawing on textile, but I mean, the idea of column is much more complicated than that. Now, then, uh, well, so. I, I just missed giving a little uh, detail about the column that is used for drawing on fabric. And here we can see there is one column in the left of the screen that is made of bamboo. And uh, the, the bulbous grip at the, near the tip that is made with cotton. And then the cotton is wrapped with cotton thread. And then this, this pen is dipped into the dye solution so that that bulbous grip can uh, soak some dye. And then it is gently squeezed so that the, the dye can flow through the tip of the pen and it can you know create the drawing on the fabric surface so this is how the column for the drawing works now in the right side of the screen there is a column which is which looks very similar however this is a column for wax drawing so this one i also got to know later on and in which what happens is we have this a bamboo uh, holder for this uh, wax drawing column and the tip is made of ironware and the ironware is then wrapped with human hair and then with cotton thread and the bulbous bulbous uh, the grip it's almost like a dome it's really huge and thick so this uh, uh, this column which is used for the resist dyeing uh, uh, resist drawing so we can see that uh, there are something, uh, if even though the, the shape of the columns are different, but they are serving somewhat similar action because they are used for making this fine, sinuous lines on various surfaces. So in terms of the drawing column that is used for drawing lines directly on the fabric, Whereas the resist dyeing column that is used for uh, making this wax resist, uh, where the color will not penetrate into in these fabrics, and then the block the block carver's column, that is something that is uh, used for making the wood blocks, right? So here we again see the those two kind of the effect of those two kind of columns. So in the left side we have the drawing column and how that is employed in drawing on Kalapari fabrics. And on the right side, we have the wood blocks carved with column, and which is uh, used for, uh, you know, and here we see the result of it, like how that has been employed for uh, carving the blocks, which will be used for printing on Kalapari. 
so when we see that there is a diffusion of this knowledge about kalam within the artisanal communities, then we understand that kalam kari technique is not something that is separated from uh, various sectors of textile making. Now, furthermore, I, later on, I also found out that uh, this this kalam is not just used the block the block makers kalam this small iron tool which is used for carving the block wood block is not something that is exclusive to the textile makers, but the vidri makers. This vidri being this very specialized metal craft practiced, uh, seem to have originated in Vidar in Deccan and also practiced in Hyderabad. So in the vidri craft, we have this very similar column, which is held by the artisans very similarly as the block makers hold their columns. And then it is again beaded with either hammer or a wooden beater. So this is how we know how this, this columns function. And they also call the same thing. They also call them color. And some of the other metal carvers also call it, the, use the same term. Now, if we go into the etymology of this term, we know that column or kalamkari, both these terms have most probably arrived in, in, in the Deccan and parts of the Boromandal from the Persian speaking world. So uh, for that reason, we still see there the Kalam Gadi, this term is used for dyed, painted, and printed textiles in Iran even now. And more interesting that uh, there is also a metal craft in which engraving and reproach system is used is called Kalam Zani. So the interconnections between the artisanal communities, which is set up by the use of this small iron tool and this term, it is not coincidental. So the way it has this distribution of the knowledge we see in the Deccan region, we see in the Persian speaking world, then we understand that this is not uh, this is not something that is happening in the level of the elites. This is not happening on the level of the courtly culture, or the traders are not merely bringing this cultural knowledge to the artisan, but the artisans themselves are connected with different craft groups. So they are not just exclusively practicing what they know, but they are actively engaged in sharing their knowledge and skill set. So this is how uh, we can see how the artisanal point of view or understanding the um, this, this technical aspects of making Kalamkari or um, at the same time, different aspects of their ongoing practice can make us think about a parallel history of intercultural exchanges, a parallel history of those, um, you know, the inter-regional inter transmission of knowledge, which runs parallelly with the, uh, you know, this dominant historical uh, narratives, which prioritizes the traders and travelers and the textiles themselves. So I think, I mean, and it's also, you know, interesting because uh, in a lot of studies in the last uh, in, in in the in the second half of the 20th century and even in the early uh, 21st century we see in a lot of studies uh, kalamkari uh, has been um, the similitude between kalamkari and different metal craft including vidri and different kind of metal engravings have been set up by the scholars and the scholars have said that there are visual similitude and that possibly means that a trader or a you know, whoever the patron were, they probably had uh, images of, of, you know, like I mean, they probably had images and they circulated the same images to different workshops. And that's the reason, you know, the traders and the travelers are those active couriers of knowledge to these different workshops. But when we understand that artisans were themselves also involved in this knowledge transmission, which were perhaps not uh, documented in the uh, you know, in the in the institutional archives. So then we know that the connection between Kalamkari and different other crafts in the Deccan and in the Middle East and elsewhere is not just on the level of the surface of the picture plane, but it is much more complicated and layered than that. So from there, I'll move on to the second case study here. And the second case study, this one focuses on the use of red dye of Kuruman. So uh, in, on screen we have this image. Uh, on screen we have this image of this beautiful red hanging, and it is gigantic. Uh, 
uh, and this one, uh, this one again comes from uh, late 17th, early 18th century from the Kormandal region. And in this one, we see this particular use of the red dye. And since the 16th century, when the travelers started, the travelers, traders, everyone started arriving in the Coromandel region, we see that the travelers, everyone have been fascinated by the use of red in the Coromandel textiles. And uh, since 16th century, we have travelers commenting on this one particular dye stuff that is called chaya. And uh, possibly this term chaya comes from the Tamil word chayam or sam. And I'm thankful to Desi Sisin and Vaishnavi Ramanathan for bringing my attention to this term. So the chaya root is something that has been hailed as this mystery dye material, which can turn this the, 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 the fabric into this brilliant blood red color. So if we, and we have seen that how it has been continued that the air of mystery that had been built up by the travelers, the chroniclers, and in one of the 17th century chronicles, we find this description where the chronicler is saying, uh, this, this child only is cultivated in this secluded island and near the confluence of river Krishna into Bay of Bengal, and only the dyers know how to get this. So there is always a mystery around this dye and dye stuff. Um, I'm sorry. Mystery around the dye stuff. And for that reason, we see that, I mean, even later on when the colonial expedition started, they had always prioritized the use of dyes, um, the chair. And there in, in the in the in the 18th century, we have um, the Scottish botanist and surgeon William Roxworth's Roxworth's work uh, and his uh, and his book, The Plants of the Coast of Coromandel, uh, which prioritized again this childhood. This his book in fact starts with a description of childhood and then uh, gives detailed description of how the plant looks like, how the root is used. And then in the second half of this, his article in this book, he gives very detailed description of the dying techniques. Now, if chai root is the only responsible factor for making uh, this formal textiles brilliant, then uh, is, it, is, it, uh, is that a problem? But I guess, I mean, uh, we can also see there are certain shortcomings. Now, when we see this, uh, that the, the botanical studies have been taking place and the chai roots were dried and sent to Western Europe for fostering the textile industry there, as well as collecting them in the major museums. So we see that uh, chai root had already turned into this collectible item. And uh, it's also something that uh, it, it is a raw material that can be exported like many other things which were exported from or taken away from the South Asia during the colonial period. So we see that chai root has been, uh, you know, has been hailed uh, in, in not only in the travelers, traders and the colonial official documents, but also in the scholarship. Now, the problem what happens with that is that when chai root arrived in Europe, it failed to yield such brilliant color. And the dyers in the Europe do not know why it happened. And by that time, they, they had uh, access to William Roxborough or the other uh, chronicler's description of the dyeing technique. But still, it is unknown that why the child would completely fail to perform in Western Europe. Now, until the, until the synthesis of turkey red, in Western Europe could not produce this kind of brilliant red uh, like the coromandel textiles could yield. Now, another issue that comes up in Roxborough's writing is that he gives this very detailed description of the dyeing technique. And at the end, somewhere else, he says that uh, I tried uh, experimenting with this dyeing technique more than 100 times. So I don't know whether we can take 100 times as actually 100 times, but at least we can agree that he might have tried the techniques for several times. And he says that he failed. He could not achieve that kind of brilliant red color. 
so there is definitely a problem already there that I mean childhood is perhaps not the only reason for which the formal textiles are uh, painted or tinted in brilliant red, right? So, and then in the 19th century, in the second half of 19th century, we see this very detailed, uh, I, I should not say description, it's a documentation uh, of Thomas Wardle. And Thomas Wardle made these extensive albums with the textile swatches, small textile swatches collected from all over South Asia. And from the, 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 the textile swatches he collected from the Hyderabad state, we see they are, um, they are, um, again, there are shades of red and number of brilliant red shades are found there. And only one of them is uh, died in childhood, but the other one is called Manjishta. There is also lag, there is also Cochinil. Cochinil was already being exported to, imported uh, to India from uh, South America. So these things we see that, I mean, this is not only one factor that is making the a brilliant, a brilliant uh, red of uh, textiles. And I was also curious to know that, I mean, what the artisans uh, have to say about it. So for that, I am very much, I'm thankful to uh, late Master Dyer uh, Mukundish Verdurao from Polavaram. So I'll be pointing my cursor here on screen to suggest where Polavaram is located. and. So we can see that Kolavaram is situated at a small distance from Machlipatnam, this coastal town, but Kolavaram is not on the coast. It's close to the coast, but it's not right on the coast. And it is also at a close proximity to the river Krishna and numerous canals are there, which are carrying the water from the river to the Bay of Bengal. So for that reason, this coastal area, this, this, this area in the Delta, they have this unique ecological factors. So they have access to both salt water and sweet water. So both salt water and sweet water flows in the canals which are around those areas. And the dyers, they, they prioritize the use of the water and they have the deep sense of ecology, the coastal ecology, the environment to understand that how to utilize these water resources, how to utilize other available, uh, you know, dye stuff and resources to add to the brilliance of the textiles they produce. Now, while talking, while talking with uh, Mukundi Garu's son, uh, Nageshwara Rao, uh, we were talking about water because it was initiated uh, by Mukundi Garu. And then later on sometime, Nageshwara Rao just jokingly said that uh, there is a Telugu saying, a local Telugu saying, which is called um, which basically means that people here think differently. And what he actually meant was people here think differently because of water. So he, uh, this, even though he just jokingly said that, but when I see this, when I see the dire's deep involvement with the coastal water sources, I'm not just the water that flows in the canals and the rivers, but they are also equally invested about the moisture in air and how that affects the dyeing technique. They, they always said that, I mean, you know, uh, a day when it is drizzling, it's really bad for dyeing because uh, that, that, uh, that prevents the textile from absorbing maximum amount of color or getting the brilliance. It always, uh, you know, it looks it's like matted. Now, uh, this, this very uh, understanding of the water and, uh, you know, they taste the water to see what is the salt content in the water when they are mixing it with the dye solution. And they also, this, this sensory understanding of the, of the uh, moisture in the air or how water is used in the different cycles of washing the fabric, treating it with myrobolan, treating with mordant, and then continuing with the printing. So in these various stages, they incorporate their knowledge of their surrounding and the material together. And this is how they proceed with their practice of uh, dyeing and printing. So again, that I mean, if I go back to the uh, discussion around chai roots, that why, why there is a problem in thinking that chai root is the ultimate solution for the brilliant red of Coromandel. 
then we see that it is the the problem goes back to the you know understanding a dominant historical narrative and then how the dominant historical narrative prevents us from seeing the other aspects of material culture or other aspects of this embodied practices so if we question this dominant narratives then there can be room for uh, recognizing the merit of the of the tires the painters printers and how they are uh, you know how they are aware of the coastal ecology how they are aware of the environment and also something interesting they said that uh, sometimes they use uh, water from a particular pond for washing and uh, if a certain kind of you know if dye preparation is uh, being taken place in during the month of monsoon then they add extra salt in the water because in, during the monsoon there is always raining and fresh water is more than the salt water so they always need the balance between salt and sweet water even there is also something interesting that there is a particular well they used to uh, fetch water from and that well was not really part of their property but it was part of someone else property but since that well uh, had water which is slightly salty that was used by the dyers but the people who owned that area they never drank from that well so this is how we see that the water and the the, the cycle of dyeing and painting in the cycle of dyeing treating with modern at the same time printing those attribute to the brilliance of these fabrics and it's not just one exportable dye stuff so we need to consider the larger perspectives on these issues so for that i mean uh, what i find interesting here is this step by step in which the fabrics are being produced for example here on screen we have this image uh, in the left where there is a uh, mirable and treated gara cotton cloth in the foreground which is completely blank and then in the left side of the image there is another mirable and treated cotton on which uh, black is printed and then modern is also printed however modern is always printed with fugitive dyes so for that reason when it is washed after printing with modern the fugitive dyes washes off and the modern stays and modern almost stays on the fabric surface as invisible um, agent. And then the same fabric, when it is boiled in alizarin or madder, then the red color restores. And in the left side of the same image, we see there is this uh, beautifully printed mehrab in which red, black, yellow, and blue, all those colors are uh, there. So during the process, the colors, like for example, when the fugitive uh, dye is used for a particular purpose, and then it washes off then with boiling the color comes back again and then it is again washed then it is again you know printed with another color so during the you know what happens here is during this process the the color uh, appears and disappears it's almost like a magical process and in which we can see in the in the in the layers of this production the various people like the tires, the washer people, uh, the people who are drying them on the, on the open fields, and the printers, the block makers, all of their knowledge is being sedimented in layers. And that is how we find that the Kalampari textile is produced. So now when we map this onto the historical textiles, then it allows us to see the textiles beyond its iconographic um, program or the, just the dyes or uh, how the motifs and everything and or the intercultural uh, you know, images have been depicted. But it allows us to think that these textiles have always been produced in layers and these layers there have always been the sedimented knowledge of different group of people who were always been involved in making the textiles. So this have been uh, the learning experiences for me and I'm thankful to them for my uh, research. Now, at the end, I'll just conclude it here by saying that usually what I did, uh, what I do in my research is to bring the printed uh, you know, images of the textiles which I study in the museums to the artisans. 
and then there was this unique opportunity in 2018 when uh, we got to invite uh, Master Block Parvar Gangadhar Kondra and Dai Specialist Jagadha Rajapa to, uh, to, to see some of those historical textiles in a museum collection and uh, have their insights on them. So it was almost like a reverse journey for me that every time you know the historical images will go to the artisans and this time the artisans came to the museum and this kind of cross exchange of culture and uh, knowledge which is uh, which i find extremely useful and would continue on this direction for my future research um, thank you thank you very much for your time and i'd be happy to have further discussion on it um, thank you, Rajeshri. Uh, very, very interesting to hear about all that. Um, so we have a few questions uh, for you. I will start with Pranjal Shah, who wants to know, uh, what made you choose to work in this field of Kalamkari? What made you choose to research this area? Sorry? What made you choose uh, okay. to work or research Kalamkari? Okay, okay. Uh, well, I mean, that actually started during my MFA because, I mean, I and then I thought that perhaps I can, I can also master the skill of wood block making. And when I tried my hands on, I failed miserably. So that failing that experience that made me conscious about the difference between the, uh, the education we get in an art institution and then uh, the artisanal knowledge uh, sources. So this is this is the first step for me that that eventually got more into uh, ethnographic research when I was uh, as part of NIAS uh, after my master's and then it went full fledged during my PhD program. So your response actually ties in with one of the other questions we have, which is that does being a practitioner help you understand the artisan's experience better, do you think? Rajeshi, can you hear? Rajeshi? I'm so there seems to be a slight uh, internet issue. Uh, Rajeshri? Okay, I think he's had one of the blackouts that he was warning us about. So if we could just hold on for a couple of minutes, I think he will be back shortly, shortly. In the meantime, as I said, if you'll have any feedback uh, for any of the lectures, for the entire lecture series, how the lectures have been put together, the range of topics, speakers, anything at all, please do let us know. It would really be useful for us. And uh, would you like to see more such things in the future? Please let us know. Rajeshri, you're back. Okay. Go ahead, Rajesh. Yes, I'm, uh, no, I'm just apologizing for this. I mean, yes, that's it. No problem, huh? Go ahead. So could you, uh, so I was just talking about my experiences at the art school, could you? So I said that it ties in with one of the questions which somebody had, which is that as a practitioner, does your being a practitioner help you understand the artisan's experience um, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. better? Yes, I mean, of course, I mean, there had been always uh, this issue that, I mean, how do we understand the technicalities of production? And because a number of times we see technique has always been, uh, uh, technique has always been uh, described as something that is disembodied. It's almost like a recipe that you follow and you achieve this goal. So for that reason, when I thought that technique is not something that is separated from the intellect of a person or a community, it can be a shared collective knowledge. So those are the things uh, as a practitioner, when I thought that as a practitioner, 
I see that technique is not something that can just merely be considered as a technical and mindless process that you follow and achieve a goal. So those are the triggers for me to see the artisanal point of view as well. But of course, I mean, I'm much more privileged than the artisans. Okay. Uh, Banu Parpia, he has a Ooh, comment. Oh, hi. Yes. He has a comment, uh, which is also, I think, a good question, actually. He says it'll be a huge contribution to map the artisanal workshops to give us a better understanding of the past especially to identify exactly where the early Kalankars were produced. Uh, but at the same time, the colors, moderns, and segments of the rivers that have the right salts that you spoke about, they're also important in identifying the early artisanal workshops. So has anything like this been done or attempted? Well, I mean, uh, from, the, from some, of the, some of the early traders' documents, we found some of the name of early, the sites. I'm sorry, sorry, early uh, what? Early, early traders' documents. And first of all, hi, Vanu. I mean, wonderful to have your question here. So, um, uh, yes, so we have some of those early traders and travelers documents. And when some of those textiles, for example, this gigantic hanging, which was collected by the Amber Palace in Jaipur, when it was collected, and then half of this textile went to the Calico Museum and half of it went to the VNA in London in the early 20th century. So when all these things happened, then there were some of those, uh, you know, like the, 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 the sales records and stuff which suggested it was made in this place called Petaboli, and which is now Nizamapatnam, again in the, uh, you know, in the, in the Delta of River Krishna. But when we visit there, we do not see anything is existing right now. And it's the same goes with another uh, site called Palakolu. Uh, which is very close to Narsapuram in, in the in the Kodabri Delta. Uh, so this place has also been uh, described in some of the hist early historical records, but now there is no sign of practicing dyed or painted textile making. So there is now crochet work has been continuing there. So such there are certain uh, issues around that. that yes, there are. You know, we can we can map the archival. Uh, those maps and then the sites onto where it is now being practiced. And you, the same goes with Kulikat as well, this coastal town of Kulikat, where we have now it's a fishing village and then there is this uh, fantastic Dutch cemetery and a church and a small museum, but there is no other sign of, uh, you know, dyed paint textile production. So this is the current state we see of the sectors and of course i mean i think it will be really useful to understand the soil conditions because there had been a number of uh, issues around that that how the black soil and you know and it's something that is close to the coast that is also being useful for yielding certain dye material mm -hmm. so and also another thing that is important is um, you know the sites around like polar varam and stuff Polavaram basically means polalu means uh, agricultural fields. So polavaram basically means a area which is all agricultural. So the rice that is produced there, the rice husk is always used for boiling dyes. Rice husk is always used for uh, you know when the wax resist was used because rice husk has this capability of keeping the level of the fire on a uh, balanced position. So that's the reason. So we see that there are different physiological factors, not only just soil and water, but also this, this agricultural activities, those are contributing to the diet textile production. Hmm. It's interesting how you mentioned earlier uh, Bidri as well, and how mm -hmm. you know they also have the same colors. So Bidri also, you must be knowing, have, has this thing in Bidar, they say you can only make it using the soil from the fort of Bidar. So. Um, well, I mean, you know, people in Hyderabad, they say the same thing. They say that, I mean, you know, we get uh, soil from these old buildings and those are the only things you can use. Yeah. Um, so kind of linked to the question about the artisanal workshop, uh, Rashmi T wants to know. So your talk was largely about uh, Kalankari in a certain region. What about in the rest of South India? Was it there in Karnataka as well? 
I mean, we do not know much about uh, Karnataka because, I mean, we have seen parts of Tamil Nadu, the coastal Tamil Nadu, there had been, uh, you know, the Kalampari production. And there have been some of the interesting factors as well, because since the, the ongoing practitioners are now mostly situated in the northern Koromandal, that's the reason I focused on that, but there had been uh, very specialized resist dyeing and discharge drug dyeing. So resisting, what happens is that uh, you use wax for resisting certain areas and then keep it in the dye bag. And in discharge, what happens is that you dye the fabric and then you use certain kind of material, some kind of acidic material, lemon and oxalic acid and stuff to remove the colors from those areas. And in Pudukottai, there had been, uh, you know, this, this very specialized resist uh, dying that, that was practiced there with this iron tip color and everything. So, uh, Sanya Jabin has a question which again links to what you're saying. Does this uh, difference in the technologies or the, the exact methods used, does that by any chance have any um, link to the, re the environment of that particular region? Mm, I mean, there, there, there can be, uh, well, like, I mean, as from the historical uh, material from the archival material, we know that in the entire Coromandel region, from the, the north in the northern and southern Coromandel both, they had production of this dye painted printed textiles. However, perhaps uh, the printing, I mean, you know, when it comes to block making, then there needs to be a forest nearby or like, I mean, somewhere from where, I mean, they can supply those wood because I mean, the wood cannot be like 25, 30 years old. It has to be at least more than hundred years. And that is the way you can have the stability in those blocks because those are always like pressed against the fabric and more than hundred times, thousand times, and it, it goes on. So it needs to be stable. So certain, Ecological factors, of course, and environmental factors, definitely they are important for um, developing these practices, yes. Okay. Um, so uh, you also highlighted the importance of water in your talk um, and how the artisans are very particular about, you know, they taste the water and they add salt if required and all of that. So um, is there any effect of uh, pollution and things like this on Kalankari? Yes, of course, of course. There has been um, a lot of discussions around that as well, because uh, after after 2000s, there was a sudden boom on silk screen printing on Kalamkari. Okay. And when uh, silk, silk printing? screen printing on silk. Kalamkari, okay. uh, silk, screen, silk screen printing. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because I mean, when the Kalamkari motifs got more popularized, then a number of artisans, number of workshops, they sort of set up these silk screen units to print more and more, which would be like easily and cheaply reproduced and, uh, you know, that can fetch the market demand. However, when they started dumping those silk screen, uh, the colors with the reducer on the cannon water, the cannon water was completely clogged and those were really hampering the works of the washer people and the dyers and everyone. Now, one of the uh, dyer and printer from Pedana, uh, Pichipa Srinivas, he actually filed a complaint against, uh, well, like, I mean, he, he, I should not say, I mean, he filed a complaint, but he brought the district magistrate's attention to this issue that, I mean, how that is, uh, you know, hampering the coastal, uh, you know, this, this area, the water sources and everything. And there had been protests about that and, you know, there had been issues around livelihood, etc. But in the last five years, we also evidence that people who had uh, suddenly came up with these screen units, they're slowly disappearing. And in the last five years, they had quite a lot, they have disappeared. And it Perhaps it owes to to a certain extent our awareness about the uh, you know hand handmade textiles. At the same time, I mean how that also sort of uh, you know how that also relates to the idea of slow fashion, which has been gaining prominence worldwide. That I mean there can be responsible consumer uh, responses to the artisanal communities, and it, that's how we can also foster. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the production process, which has been continuing for, which has been promoting sustainability, basically, right? Mm. 
Okay. Um, Anna George wants to know, um, do the artists whose works are there in the museums get due credit? No, not at all. That is, that is the biggest problem, right? Only after 1960s, certain artists like Gurapa Shetty Garu and then Muni Krishnan Garu, they, their works whom we know, they got like their uh, name at least. I mean, I won't say that works were duly uh, given the credit, but at least their names are mentioned. But before that, no artists are named. And that mm -hmm. had also been a huge problem in the scholarship on Indian art in general, because mm -hmm. like things like unknown India, and then, you know, the artisans should always be unnamed and they just do their work. We do not need to recognize them. This myths have heavily damaged this entire paradigm. Yeah. Um, Pranjal Shah wants to know, do we see any change in designs from the period of origin till today? Oh, of and, course, a lot. Yeah, okay. Of course, uh -huh. a lot we see. And, uh, you know, what is interesting for me to see those things that, I mean, I, as I'm saying that, I mean, I do not really see Kalamkari, uh, you know, the historical Kalamkari linearly, connect, linearly connected with the present production, present day production. So, like, I mean, you know, last year when I was visiting the Blockmakers Workshop, I saw the small blocks which were cars and like ice cream cones and everything. Okay. So what is interesting for me is that, I mean, they are not afraid of taking challenges. And it's the same kind of spirit that actually pushed their practice in the early modern period as well, because they perhaps did not know those Chinese phoenix or those Dutch heraldic symbols, but they were not afraid of taking the challenges. They already have the knowledge structure, which can absorb this kind of different, you know, the new challenges and they can successfully execute them. And the same thing they're doing now as well. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, Vidya Nagaraj wants to know, is there any attempt to uh, um, revive some of the older motifs? Of course, there had been a lot. And one of the major, uh, one of the major revival projects were taken place during 1980s, during uh, or before the uh, Festival of India in Britain and in the USA in 1982 and 1985. So during that time, Kutul Jaikar uh, and uh, Martin Singh, they, you know, made this uh, month-long workshops in this uh, artisanal workshop spaces, and then they they sort of like I mean made very, you know, very conscious effort to revive some of the earlier motifs which were almost falling out of practice. So mm -hmm. that that had been there, and also Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay. Who, who was uh, you know, at the AIHB was, has been very, very, very influential and uh, took very effective steps to revitalize certain aspects of practice at the same time, also certain motifs in the 1950s. Hmm. Okay, uh, Pradita Nambiar has a question. Uh, so you focused on Kalamkari and the cloth, but what about, is there any craft to the making of the wax, for example, she wants mm -hmm. to know? The wax. Hi. Now the sad part is that I mean the wax resist drug, uh, you know the, the, the wax resist drawing is no longer practiced in. Uh, no, you know, um, in, in the... Sorry, Rajeshri, I meant the vat in which they dye. Uh, you know the, oh, oh, oh. the wooden vats. Yeah. Oh yes, 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 yes. Of course, I'm sorry, I didn't get it uh, right. <laughs> so yes, of course, the, the the vat has been very important. Like I mean, you know, uh, there are two kind of vats. So one is cold vat, one is hot vat. So the cold vat is indigo, which should not be boiled because it's very uh, sensitive. If you boil it, I mean, the character will completely go off. And then the other colors, for example, like yellow or red, like madder or chaya roots and all those things need to be boiled. And for chaya roots and madder and this stuff, they never use iron vessel for boiling. They usually avoid iron because they say that, I mean, uh, reaction between the alum, the, the, the matter, and the iron that sort of like makes the color much more darker. So they try to use um, copper pot for that. And for the other colors, they can use iron vessels and boil it. Yes. Okay. Um, just a minute. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I think this will be our last question. There are some more, but we are running out of time. So I will make this the last one. 
Uh, Emily Chakraborty wants to know: um, Is the art now being integrated with other lesser-known craft forms of India? Well, like I mean, in one hand, we see that I mean the GI or the geographical indication that had you know that is suggesting that one region, one craft, and this this activity is sort of it tend to show that I mean this one region specializes in one craft. But mm. we need to see that I mean there had always been connection between this, uh, you know, the artisans were always connected. But on the governmental level, I do not see that 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 kind of uh, you know. I, I I do not see that I mean the conscious connections between different craft practices have been set up in that way. Okay. Well, specialized was... craft always gains more attention than something that is interconnected with many other things. Hmm. Okay. Um, one last one, since you just meant, sorry, I'll just sneak this one question in. Um, so today, like there's this revival of Kalamkari and it's being seen as this product, a very a rather elite product. What was it like in, uh, you know, in the 16th century, 17th century? Was it again an elite product or no? Is. It seems like, I mean, you know, as Professor Radhika Session was mentioning that there had been many kind of textile production. And even like, I mean, when we see this 19th century records of like Hathaway and people who were, uh, you know, giving all the documents of how many took the bulk of cotton which were exported from the Coromandel Coast, it seems this painted chins and the glazed chins, which is even more specialized than this, and those were only a small fraction of the entire production because it's mm. very time consuming. And the people who made these fabrics, they were not, they could not afford to wear them. And it's something that's a sad truth we can still see now. Mm. So that, that had always been the case, yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay, thank you Rajeshree for that really light, enlightening session. Um, Smriti, would you? Yeah, so, um, yeah, like Nija said, thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. I mean, I was also thinking it's interesting, like, the, in, whether it's, you know, you talk about the field in archaeology, or you're talking about the textiles, we think of only the textiles as the object of study, or the field as a landscape. But there's so many people who you're interacting with, like in your case, it is artisan craft persons. In ours, it may be like, you know, uh, people who are, uh, sharing knowledge in terms of landscape or you know uh, different things and are working alongside but like you're saying there's not much I mean acknowledgement of it uh, mm -hmm. and it's largely glossed over in a lot of when we talk about it so I'm really glad that you spoke so much about it because I think you know it's something we need to and there I know there has been conversation especially in anthropology to talk about this whole thing but nonetheless I think when we present it, it's nice that we also acknowledge this. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Um, but I was also thinking the other really interesting thing for me was like this, the, the way you broke uh, time frames that we normally divide into ancient, medieval and modern, because I think that that's nice. And the disciplinary kind of things where you're taking stuff from different methods and sources and uh, building this story. and. And, you know, I think it's clothes that we wear, but we forget all of this that goes into eating, <laughs> understanding it. Um, so thank you so much. That was really fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, so I should probably say something about tomorrow's talk as well. Uh, tomorrow's talk is by Dr. Selva Kumar. Uh, and he's going to be talking about literary sources and how they connect with uh, the question of urban, uh, I think specifically with reference to Sangam literature uh, as well. Uh, so we look forward to his talk and thank you so much for all of you for joining us and for the really, really interesting questions. Thank you and uh, see you tomorrow. <laughs>